everybody, this is James the Bone, the Scovenant, dedicated to original peoples as always. We've got a special guest on, John Williams, who worked for the Anthony Walker Foundation. How are you doing, my brother? I'm sound, mate. I'm sound. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Great anyway. Yeah, you know, we first met at um, the Winter Gardens um, the on Cairns Street, and it was to do with their the return project. And you came in and showed your support, you know, brought, brought um, one of the young youths in. You know, that was very interesting. We got into discussion about many things, African history, you know, um, many things anyway. So where did you begin with you? And you were born in London, weren't you? And you moved to Jamaica very early. Yeah, yeah, James, they, uh, my my life story is like a quilt. It's like a checkered quilt. So uh, mom and dad came here, you know, in the 50s when it was after the war, come to the motherland and build up the country and help everything else. So they came to Britain, my dad first, and then um, Bid got my mom up with him. They had five children, of which I'm the youngest. Um, because of the level of racism and the challenges, mom didn't settle. And so after a couple of years, they went back to Jamaica. So I lived in Jamaica from I was three until I was 19. So all of my formative years were spent in Jamaica. Wow. Okay. So, so what part of Jamaica? I was young when I went there. About thirteen, I went to Kingston, Ochi Rios, um, Bull Bay as well. So, just like a like, holiday visit to some family members and that. So, what part of Jamaica did you grow up on? How was it like? What was it like growing up in Jamaica? Um, do you know what I, I? I always say to people that I never knew what racism was or experienced racism until I was nineteen. But looking back of light, uh, and I'll explain to you why. I am um, in Jamaica, you can imagine it, majority black. Yeah. But even though I went back to Jamaica in 1972 when I was three and subsequently went through primary education, secondary, and had further education, I recall that all of the people in positions of power, the head teachers, the the prime minister the deputy the opposition leaders were all white wow and um i never twigged at that early age so growing up in jamaica i, I was blessed that i my parents were from the parish of saint anne so jamaica's got 14 parishes and um i was from the parish of saint anne a little place called discovery bay and again, even that name is ironic because it's Discovery Bay because apparently that's where Christopher Columbus landed when he discovered the island. How the hell can you discover an island with people already living there? But we'll we'll digress. Yeah. So yeah, uh, um, and and the 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 great thing, James, is that the where I grew up was only um about thirty miles from where Bob Marley actually grew up because Bob Marley is from the same parish. So same time is. Yeah, I visited this so, house. So have I, mate, and it's it, it's quite a spiritual journey I found. Yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So, um, what was it like here? So, like you said, um, the head teachers were white. Um, was the prime minister white? Did you say? Yeah, we had uh, at the time the two leaders. There are two main parties in Jamaica. You had the JLP, Jamaica Labour Party, which was led by Edward Siaga and the People's National Party, which was led by Michael Manley. Both of them, if you check them out on um, anything that you look at, you look in, they're going to don't look like me. The pigment in the skin is a bit massively yeah. different. We were we were taught history, and the history that I was was taught, and we, we said this when we met that day, which was, um, I think it was fate that we met, and I said to you, the history that I learned to subsequently discover that I was taught lies because the, the history that I learned was that yes we're descendants of slave we were brought to the Caribbean on the slave ships we were part of this slave or my four parents were part of this slavery um a, a whole thing and then initially the Great Britain realized that what they were doing was wrong and so they um emancipated the slaves and then we all live happily ever after and that was the, the history in a nutshell that I was taught. The, the 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 thing that I find painful, and when I do a lot of talks now, because as I said to you, I've been working for the Anthony Walker Foundation for the past three years, and some of the talks that I did is where does discrimination come from? Where does 
superiority and inferiority come from. Uh, when you look at it, I was taught that Africa was backwards on the developing. Most people in Africa live in Mordots. You know, so it's almost like my history was started on a slave ship. Yeah, now yeah. I'm a 55-year-old, what I would call a 55-year-old old man. No, no, I'm better informed that we had kingdoms in Africa. You know what I mean? We were kings, we were queens. Yeah. Our history right. didn't start on a slave ship. Our history started well before then. Yeah. You know, but so, so so those are the bits that I try to um educate people and, and when we were talking James I said to you there's something that I don't know if you will object to it but I'd like to just give a snapshot of a couple of things that punctuate my life being brought up in Jamaica you know a lot of things about Usain Bolt, Donald Quarry, Michael Olden whatever else yeah. but there's certain things that punctuate my, my mind and when we met I was stood next to speakers and everything else and music is a big part of my life. And this song, if it just play you a little snapshot, mate, if I'm allowed to, it's literally going to be 30 seconds. Go for it. You will. This song played a big part in my life, and I'm just going to see what you think. Had it, had it featured in your, yours? Yeah, music, you know, keeps us going in life. Can't live without our music. Oh, pirates, yes, they are. Of course. Going back to the merchant ships. Mm. Minutes after they to come. From the now, now that song, James, and a play that it's called Redemption Song by Bob Marley. Yeah. Quite, quite young, I found out that if I wanted to. If I wanted to achieve anything in life, if I wanted to break the chains, if I wanted to break the battle, the, the, the chains and the shackles, sorry, I had to interpret the next line in this song. And Bob Marley said, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Definitely. None but ourselves, we free our minds. And that that resonates with me, but it took me almost forever to break that mental slavery. Because I, I just think, even though the shackles were off my grandparents and great grandparents, and where I grew up in Jamaica, we had culture. You know, it, it, they, they talk about it doesn't take a person to raise a child; child it takes a village. My yeah. village helped to raise me, but yeah. yet still, when I moved back to the UK in 1989, I still found that I was expected to fit into a certain narrative. I was expected to fit into a certain bracket. And I think those were some of the challenges that I had to overcome, especially when I subsequently joined the police before working for AWF. Okay. Wow. Was that in London or where, where was that? Uh, Merseyside. So we did 30 years in Merseyside. And... So I, I, at the age of about 10, 11, I remember my, see my dad cried for the first time, James. And my dad was, it was a builder. He was a hard man. You know, he was um, not as in hard fighting, but he looked like an oak tree that would never remove. Nobody can knock him to. And I saw my dad absolutely devastated. I've never seen him cry before. And you know, you think, oh my word, the world's going to end. And as it turned out, his brother was murdered and wow. me uncle Lloyd was murdered and nobody ever got found guilty for it. Nobody was ever prosecuted. Nobody was ever charged with it. And that interested me in, in law enforcement. I, I have had this inane, this innate desire to do the right thing. Yeah. I hate bullies. I hate people. To oppressing others. So I joined Merseyside Police in 1991 and I retired in March of 2021. And there's certain things that I'm proud of, James. I became the highest ranking black detective ever in Merseyside Police. So I retired as the first of a black detective chief inspector. But so I got to in, win. So when we say Merseyside, I knew you, you 
you lived in St. Helens. Was we talking about St. Yeah. Helens? Yeah, yeah. So no, no. So I lived in St. Helens, but I've worked all over. I've worked from Liverpool, Southport to the Wirral. I've, I've covered all the Mersey sides. Okay. But if I rewind to 91 when I joined, I remembered um, my own colleagues would use the N-words quite openly on um, on in front of me. Yeah. I remember... Um, walking down a corridor and people would be walking behind you like a chimp and if you say anything you were the problem you had a chip on your shoulder i remembered um people just i felt like i was surveilled 24 7 you know yeah. I, I felt like it was always somebody informing on me and one of the things that sticks with me until gonna be till i die i remember my mom was poorly in jamaica and i went back to jamaica to see her and when I came back to Manchester Airport, I got searched. And the reason I got searched was because a colleague had put two and two together in May 20 that I'd been to Jamaica, so I must be coming back with drugs. You know, and, and wow. to, to sort of to overcome that, and, and it would be remiss of me not to point out that there are a number of good people who helped me along the way, you know, irrespective of race, colour, creed within the police. Yeah. But again, go back to that, Bob Marley's song about emancipating yourselves from mental slavery and um, making sure that you know your own history. Because if, if you don't know your past, you can't direct your future. And I That's think right. my, my, my grounding growing up in Jamaica and the confidence that I had was what sustained me to last 30 years. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, quite a bit of a story that, you know, but, um, there's many, you know, racism growing up here, you know, we were, as black people, always getting stopped by police, you know, randomly, just, you can see even like, even this coming, well, like you say, even coming through on an airport, everywhere. But racism though, um, like I say, as a, as a traveling man, who's been around many countries, around different continents, there's something that we have like, it's like a caste system around the planet. And some people might like look and think, well, racism seemed to start in during the transatlantic slave trade or colonialism. But it actually, if you go further back, even in India, they had a caste system, even like 1500 yeah. BC. They were invaded by the Aryans, the Brahmin people. Yeah. These are a white race that came in. And they would use these to the advantage to be able to take over and then have offsprings again and then produce different shades of complexions and then have like hierarchies and lower higher. Then you have the untouchables at the bottom and all that. So only from going and researching history, you're learning these things. And these are the things how important um, history is. You know, it's history is not only something that we need to know 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 400 years ago. We need to know it for as long as it's documented or it's even oral history, whatever we've got to do to put all the pieces together. And what it basically is, is Africans used to always go different places around the planet anyway. We couldn't navigate, you know, people yeah. are yeah. saying that we couldn't navigate, we couldn't, eat. we were just tribals or like fighting with each other. We had no civilization. Then when you start looking deep into it, you start seeing that we are not only the first people on the planet, but we also are the first civilized people on the planet. And the people like Europeans, they were living backward. They were the backward people, you know, and we've obviously, they've had contact with Africans due to through the Moors, through even people from Carthage, you know, through the ancient Egyptians, when people used to come to Egypt, like the Greeks, the Romans, they'd all come to learn. The Persians have come to learn. So they all had contact with Africa and benefited of Africa. They benefited from the Moors going in when there was the Dark Ages, you know, the first universities they built, introduced them to baths, <laughs> you know, mathematics, you know, everything we've introduced them to, but we never get the credit for it. But at the end of the day, the conqueror always seems to write the history. So yeah. it was definitely yeah. a blessing for me to realize the importance of knowing our history. I mean, I was fortunate to have Nigeria on my father's side where we kind of already knew where we were from, our geographical yeah, area, yeah. our tribe. So that was the great thing. But at the same time, on my mum's side, we have Trinidad. So we got only knew about the slave trade, 
you know what I'm saying? So main thing yeah. is, is like, yeah. nothing can stop you going and getting your history, especially at the moment, the time within, you have the internet there. Years ago, think about how hard it was to know your history. You have to go and get books. Yeah. Yeah. You know, look for teachers to teach you, and there wasn't that many who could teach yeah. you. You know, the great Marcus Garvey, you know, rest in peace, he was one of the greatest yeah. inspirational figures for me, coming from Jamaica. Yeah. And he was so ahead yeah. of his time, Pan-Africanist, and he was able to see, well, you know, let's come collectively as Pan-African groups from wherever you are in this world, the African diaspora, home and abroad, you know what I'm saying? What did you think of Marcus Garvey being from Jamaica? Do you know, um, it, it's again ironic that you, you mentioned Marcus Garvey, because Marcus Garvey was from a place called St. Anne's Bay, and St. Anne's Bay is the capital of the parish where I came from, St. Anne. So um, mm -hmm. the where Marcus Garvey was born and bred, uh, there are a number of um, it, it, very influential people out there. So I don't know if you've ever heard of Third World. Uh, um, the, the couple of bands which come out of St. Anne's Bay, and um, Marcus Garvey, was one of, he's one of the national heroes in Jamaica. And again, one of the things that, as you alluded to, we talk about is um, self-enhancement. It's all in your own future. It's about your own value. It's about your own worth. Um, if you look back again in all those years, Marcus Garvey was pursued and basically stitched up by the hierarchy in America yeah. because he was talking about listen black people you know what if you want to if you want to better yourself you've got to start looking within instead of looking externally yeah you, you the couple of things that I uh, spoke about recently and I spoke about somebody who's held quite in reverence by a lot of people and it's um Gandhi for the work that Gandhi did to free the Indians etc cetera, etc cetera. But at the same time, Gandhi was castigating black people. He was a racist Gandhi. You know, yeah, yeah. He, he was castigating black people. He still saw us as lowest of the low. Whilst Marcus Garvey wasn't going out attacking any other race, colour, creed, he was actually doing what I wish a lot more of us do now, James, and that is focus within. Yeah, the, the, the within. young man who I introduced you to on the night um, when we met. Oh, yeah. His story absolutely broke my heart, but it's, sadly, it's not a one-off. You know, you've got our young people growing up now, and you say to them about people like Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, um, they haven't got a clue what they are, who they are, and what they've done. And we, we need to look back now and sort of educate our own people. The, yeah. the 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 sad thing is, having grown up in Jamaica, we have got one of the highest murder rates. Right. I'm looking every day on the news, and I'm looking at. I've got family living in South London. I lived in East London. It pains me to see our own killing our own, yeah. and. I know your conditions. You can always talk about the social elements, the, the deprivation, the 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 fact that people doesn't feel bought into system, into the mainstream of anything else. And by that I mean, um, I went to a school. I won't name which school it was, but I went to a school, and this school took in a number of students who were excluded from mainstream education, if that makes sense, and. The first thing that stood out to me was how dedicated and professional the teachers were and that they were really invested in these youngsters. But the thing that broke my heart again was that most of these kids were black. And when I say black, I'm using the term generically as yeah. in either black or mixed parentage or mixed heritage. And you go, at what stage were they just sidelined out of mainstream society? Uh, how many? What are they going to do if they're excluded from school? What are they going to do if they need so they're not in employment, education, or any training? What are we setting up our our young people to do? Uh, and if you look, when we had the Toxteth uprising, people call it riot. I say it's uprising. If you oh, oppress, right. yeah. you are going to you are going to uprise. But I don't know if you've um, Kenneth Oxford was the chief constable. 
Okay. The Merseyside Police at the time. And Kenneth Oxford had openly said, it's not about the blacks, it's not about the whites. And he used the derogative term, which is half caste. You know, I'm quoting that he used that term and he said, it's the half caste people who are products of black male sailors and white prostitutes. Yeah, you know, I've got I think I've heard that's it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? My, my kids are mixed heritage. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm, 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 and it, it's how can you say it? But he wasn't challenged. He wasn't disciplined. Mm. It was it was almost so, so when I he left the police two years after I joined. So surprise, surprise, when I joined, you had a lot of racists within the police. And and please let me let me explain this i'm not saying every police officer is a racist because there are a number of good officers who help me but if you've got the head of an organization coming out with phrases like that where are you going to lead the people you know so in short we need to start getting more about marcus garvey out there we need to start getting things about um not just marcus garvey we need to talk about that there are a number of um, really, really educated and influential people in Merseyside, especially in L8. You know, yeah. I, I had the, 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 the privilege of working with a couple of them. You know, Ray is one of them. I don't know if you know Ray. Ray, Ray and I were chatting a couple of, couple, of, couple of months ago, probably about eight, nine months ago. And he, he, he showed me couple of pictures. This is Ray Corless. Oh, yeah, and he, yeah, yeah. He, he showed me some pictures with his ancestors. And yeah. he had pictures of his ancestors who were mixed heritage going back to Victorian time. You yeah, know, yeah. I, okay. I, I was always made to feel, James, that we are almost invaders. We're invading the British store. We're invading Europe. We're invading. And you go, when he showed me that, we were sat in a restaurant. I struggled not to cry because I thought, oh, my God, we belong. It was in my discovery that I discovered that. Did you know there were regiments that fought for the UK in both First and Second World War? And there were the West Indian Regiment. I know there were other African regiments, but I'm just talking about my ancestors now. Yeah, yeah. There were West Indian Regiment, and some of them paid their own boat fare to come here and fight for the motherland. And after the war, they were told to go home. Now, now think about it. If, if you think you belong, it's like my kids coming home and saying, Dad, look what I've done. And the minute I get the benefit, I said to them, get out of my house. Yeah. Well, you know what, though? What it's like, really, is like... <clears throat> I mean, we have different points of views in Liverpool. Um, for some people who've got ancestors in Liverpool, like, more than 100 years ago, they might view things slightly different. Now, for me, I just see myself as African. It's much more easier for me to deal with myself as an African. I know some of the other peoples, they use this term Liverpool born black on, you know, that's how they describe themselves. For me, that, that, that that's not for me. But not to each of their own, each of their own. Yeah, yeah. But I don't subscribe yeah. to that because here's an example. In the Roman army, they hired a lot of African people to used a lot of African people to fight in their armies. They used many other yeah. different peoples. Armies are the, it's all about using people. You bring people in from different places to join your army. And what happens is that people can get very comfortable. Then when you get very comfortable, then you're told afterwards, it's time to leave now. But yeah. This, yeah. this is where they go back to education. Do you know what I'm saying? And yeah. Liverpool, <clears throat> it's very difficult for me to connect with many people from Liverpool as far as pan-Africanism. Liverpool is a very watered-down place. And mm. it's a place full of excuses where people don't want to identify as Africans. And yeah. yet there's very different, many reasons. You know, we had this in the Caribbean. We could have this in the United States. We can have this in the UK. But at the same time is 
I have built like a platform basically on Pan-Africanism. I interview people, black people from anywhere in the world. I don't, I'm not subscribed to only Liverpool. I see yeah. us all as one people. And yeah. I travel all around melanated places and I connect with them. I, even if it means me go to the most secluded areas, 10, 12 hour drives, I'll do that just to be around black people. And I know when I'm around black people that I'm connecting with the original peoples. I go into Asia, for example, and I'm about to go to the rainforest in like Thailand, from Malaysia to Indonesia to Philippines, all these places. And you start seeing the true history when you meet these indigenous peoples. So, and in the Pacific Islands, the same, you know, people out in Fiji tell you, we come from Africa. So when they're saying we reach Fiji 1500 BC, not 15 years ago, 1500 BC, and they're remembering through their oral history that they came from Africa. And people can be here for like 100 years or they could be in the Caribbean so many years. So the Black Liverpool thing, I'm totally not for it. I'm, you know, we African people and I'm African first. I understand that wherever we go on this planet, we are the original peoples. And I'll give you an example. Yeah. I yeah. understand we have Cheddar Man that goes back 10,000 years in Britain, 10,500 years, something like that. But that was back then. Do you get what I'm saying? And yes, yeah. Yeah. Africans have always moved around different places. It's only until we had trade routes stopped where we couldn't, where we had to be, you know, go through a third party now, you know. And this is not just Europeans, this is also Arabs as well, <laughs> you know, Persians, as many different peoples who've tried to conquer African people. So this is why it's so important to deal with the source. Africa as the birthplace and the base. So when, when you want to connect to our people of the diaspora or whatever, recognize Africa as, as the base, the birthplace, and that, that's yeah. our headquarters. Yeah. We should be having great relationships with African people. That's how we should be. Now, it's funny because um, there's different people. There's people who come over, like uh, your family, you said, in the, did you say the 50s or was it early? 50s, yeah, yeah. Now, this 50s. is Windrush time, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I've got yeah. some other friends who, and got some family members who came over during these times anyway. Yeah. My grandfather was one of them from Trinidad. So basically, um, it's all about recognizing that. When you're brought, when we come here, we are being, we are brought here for the reason. We're not, we haven't brought just to be friends and happy and you know, this is who we are. No. It's a lot more no. deeper than that. You understand, John? Yeah. yeah. That's it. The, the big thing, James, that, that, <laughs> and you hit the nail on the head a um, couple of times when you were speaking, then, and you talk about black. Let's 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 just focus on the word black before we even talk about where we start. And being in a, in in the public sector, it's imperative that you describe things as they are. Being in a police force is even more crucial when you're describing something. And we 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 leave the person out of it for now. We'll talk about something, you know. Just to check, I don't know how old you are, but I'll show you my age and go. If you look back at the Ford Orion, then if you're old enough to remember Ford Orion, Ford Orion, you will be saying it's a Ford Orion in green four door with X amount of windows blocked out, the whatever, and you would give the specific information about that car. If you're doing a truck attractor, you will be straight away. And okay. it will always be a Ford Orion. If you see it tomorrow, it's a Ford Orion. Ten years, it's a Ford Orion. In my 30 years in the police, our people have had so many things change about their identity. So when I joined, you were coloured. Yes. And then a couple of years later, you were Afro-Caribbean. And then we move on and then we became BAME, and then we became IC3, and we became IC2. And we I can keep going and going and going and going. And you just go, I can't remember ever going to any government or any organisation and say, excuse me, today I don't want you to call me black anymore. Right? So you've got to almost think, why are they moving us into little pigeonholes? to try and isolate and segregate us is the first thing. Secondly, I go back to the slavery voyage and everything else. 
because our narrative, most of us were taught about our life start on a slave ship, we were susceptible to follow whatever people tell us and who we are. You have mentioned your granddad, and if you focus on your granddad for a couple of minutes, your granddad, if I'm right, and correct me if I'm wrong, came from Africa. Yeah. So his narrative didn't start on a slave ship. That's right, yeah. He made that decision to come here. Yeah. It's it's not like he's descendants of slave, etc., etc., etc. So you can stand there and you can say, you know what? I'm a black man and I'm not some Afro-Caribbean, not this. I, I don't know if you remember years ago, and again, showing my age, we used to celebrate our colour. We yeah. used to celebrate who we are. These are... And I'm going to interrupt you with a little piece of music again. Yeah. Do you hear that? Not yet, no. Can you hear that? Just listen to the first couple of words. Yeah. I'm just going to let it play for two minutes. Quite low. I'm proud to be the colour that God made me, right? And then you listen to what you said. I just want to sing. Black is my colour, right? So we, she is singing black is a colour. But nowadays, if if you go somewhere and somebody's explaining that, all of a sudden we're radical. Yeah. All of a sudden, oh, they're, they're making a big issue. But alongside that, James, throughout the 30 years, I've never seen white change. Yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. follow me. Yeah. And I'm not saying this, I'm not racist. My my wife's white. We've been married 29 years ago, but her description has changed, stayed the same. It's yeah. almost you're always white. You know your heritage, you're white, you're this, you're white, you're white, you're white, you're white. So why is it ours are changing? And it's it's it for me, it's no surprise that some of our youngsters feel so lost. Yeah. The, the 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 event that I you and I met and um, I met Patrick before and then met Nasra before and the reason why I go back and do that and I want to connect with the young people is first of all I feel privileged that I can say to young people listen this is how you stay out of trouble this is how if you're getting stopped or you're getting in a certain position don't give away your rights that is the first thing. The second thing, though, is when I look at most of these young kids now, if they go to Granby Street, if they go Princess Street, if they go to Brixton, if they go to Leeds, if they go to Chapel Town, most of the youngsters, young male I'm talking, black male on the street who I see, they're just like me. The only difference is growing up in Jamaica, I wasn't under surveillance 24-7. Yeah, yeah. The only other thing, there's a black elder who would tell me a little bit about my past. Yeah, your granddad used to work up there, your granddad. And I go back, you know, Bob Marley, and I started with Bob Marley, and I'll end with Mark, Bob Marley. If you think about it, Bob Marley he did a song called War, and he said, until the philosophy which holds one race inferior and another superior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned, everywhere will be war. And when you when you listen to those, why are we keep re getting relabeled? They don't even do it to animals. If you look at horse mm. pigs, well, there's an interesting one, John. Right, if my podcast show is called Original Peoples. You heard me intro at the beginning, Original Peoples. I did also a documentary um, a few months ago with people like Nasra Patrick and several other people. I call the original peoples. Now, the reason why is because we are, there's no argument with the word original peoples. There's like mm -hmm. an example with the word black now. We can see where it come from. The time of the Moors being in Europe and there was 
did this thing of like what color were the Moors, were the black people or the Africans, were the Arabs, were the this, were the that. Now we know that the majority were African people, black African people, and there was some Arabs, yes. So basically, when the British de described, he wanted to distinguish the two different Moors. <laughs> so he said he called the Arabs Moors or mulatto people and decided to use the term black Moor to describe the Africans. So yeah. then, then the Moor got dropped and then just was left as black. But if you really think about this, though, is original peoples. I, I came with that title because I felt like when we overused the word black, we're overusing something what the oppressors has put onto us. So yeah. Yeah. one thing that I felt that we can we don't have to disagree on, we could agree on, whatever we are in this world, is that we original peoples. Yeah. And a lot of people gravitated yeah, like towards that. A lot of people gravitated towards that. And yeah. it, it was a great thing to see people like it feels more empowerment, you know, way more yeah. empowerment. Yeah. Because of original peoples yeah. of Africa, and like I say, I'm a traveler and I'm meeting all these original melanated peoples. I don't even have to use the word black, Australia, yeah. Pacific Islands, yeah. through Asia, even the original Europeans. So this is why I will deal with original peoples because I had to explain to people when we did the documentary. Don't overuse the word black. Yeah. Because now it's it's very difficult to tell people that because we're so used to it. I'll I'll just say it myself, <laughs> like I did before. But I do yeah. try oh, to yeah. Yeah. rethink to myself and think, you know what? We can't just always use the word that the oppressor's given us. And I'll give you another example. The Chinese don't call themselves a colour. They're called Chinese. Indians don't call themselves a colour. Yeah. They're called yeah. Indian. Yeah. So why for us? Oh, yeah that we have to only be a colour, oh, yeah, right. and then we go through all these different stages of colour, black or the black this, black that, black. Yeah, the, and yeah, then it's in the dictionary black. as well, black labels, yeah. you know, black bold. So yeah. control our own narrative is what I say, John. You know what? I really, really like that. I I'm mindful that my clock is showing one minute and 45 seconds, so we just want to make sure what's going to happen. Are we just going to get cut off or what happened next, you know? Oh, I'm talking. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I just just thought I'll, I'll highlight that. But you, you know what? That's food for thought, James. And what I like about these type of conversation is that I'll walk away now. You've given me food for thought. Good. You know, I, I, you've given me food for thought. I have always pushed in. I'm black. I'm black, and this is the way I'm. I'm black and whatever. And as time has gone on, you go. No, I'm African. I know where I know where my gene pool started. I did the um, ancestry DNA test, and wow. I'm fifty one percent Nigerian. Wow. You know, yes, and then Nigerian. the other twenty yeah, percent, the other twenty percent is Togo and um, Ghanaian and, and and or Southern Bantu people. And yeah, my ultimate is. dream, the, the reason why I linked up when I spoke to Nasra about the um the program is that that is now my part of my bucket list. I want to go back to where it started. Yeah. So the term original peoples, you know, this is very important. And you were saying before, you like the sound of original people. So interesting to hear your take on it. Rather than just always using the word black, like the Chinese just don't call themselves a color. They say Chinese, Indians, could be Turkish people. But everything changes with us. <laughs> do, do, do you know what? And you're right, going back to you saying the original people. We we are, I think all of us, and even at 55, I think we are all, not brainwashed, but we are all um, almost institutionalised. So we, we, we are used to saying things that we were labelled with. Yeah. You know, and, and until you said it, I've not looked at it like that. I think I, I, I'd, I'd probably now either be using more original people or Africans yeah. because the the, the 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 everything else and, it, and that's why I always say you know um it's good to talk. I like talking to people who who make me think. You know um because yeah. we can go we can go with the the the, the, the I was playing James before um we we came back I was playing a song by Nina Simone. I don't know if you've heard of Nina Simone. Yeah, uh, yeah. Nina Simone did a lot of freedom 
songs and things and she did a song that I wish I know how it means to be free and I was just playing it and I'll play you a little bit of it I wish I could say all the things that I should say say them aloud say I'm free for the whole wide world to see and I, I I listen to songs like these, and I should explain to you why I'm always have a selection of music on tap, and that is because during what I call the dark days in the police, when things were really on top of me, and I was I was struggling. There were there were points, James, that I'm not ashamed of saying it. I was near breaking point. You're in a lonely space, and music was what got me through it. You know, and and Go back if 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 I encapsulate encapsulate what you've just said about the original people and we are Africans. Think of what Nina Simone is saying. I wish I know how to be free, and it shows that even at fifty five, I am not free because I have I've normalized that label. Yeah. Hmm. See if you get what I mean. I, I, it's become a part of my psyche, and um, I've got two adult kids, and. I was walking around so proud that my adult kids, even though the, the, the mixed heritage, identify themselves as black. But you go back and you go, but why have we done it? And, and until you said it, I wouldn't have thought about it. Now, now I'm one of those. I, I describe myself as I've been relatively successful. I've had a good career. I've done that. But you never stop learning, do you? Don't. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> You have just taught me something that I'll go away now and I'll put that into whatever I deliver. Yeah. I'll make sure when I'm talking to young people, I'm not... Yeah. yeah. So it's one of them, James. I I love conversation like this because I'll be on a buzz for the rest of the day because it's it's productive, it's enlightening, it's, it's got you thinking. You know what I'm saying? And... and we don't realise how much was eroded from us as a people. Uh, and it, it's almost like a river. You divert it, but the river's trying to come back to the original path. And we have been so brainwashed and so indoctrinated that it's going to take a lot for us to start seeing us for who we are. Yeah, it, you know? it's, not, it, it's not an easy... I mean, for some of us, it's not too easy, especially um, when parents might not be too educated themselves, and they're yeah. you know they're not there to even educate their own, you know. And then same time, yeah. people just some people are not even focused on the issue; they just focus on survival. Sometimes, yeah, you know, yeah. some people are just focused on what's the latest trend, you know, um, yeah. what can yeah. they say to fit in with people, and the problem is, is like. <clears throat> It's okay, you know, uh, certain trends and all that, but to not have a sense of who you are, where you came from, where your future is, where your past is, then the lights are dim, you know, as a future. So if different people started educating, now we're talking about organising things, you have to organise events, but what it is is um, in a place like Liverpool, when any events of like African descent, send them people's try and put together, when it's dealing with something like pure and positive, it seemed you'd hardly get numbers there. But it seemed when you yeah. deal with things like negative things, like the slave trade yeah. and this and that, yeah. you'll just get yeah. swarm numbers of people, not just black people, you get all sorts of different people there because it's what people yeah. know. And it seems like, not all white people, but a lot of white people do like us talking about the slave trade. They seem yes. to all yeah. want to come along and like, oh, look at yeah. these people, what can we do to help? And well, yeah. In reality, yeah. no, we had a history before the slave trade is very important because you, if you want to really understand us, don't understand us through slavery, understand us who we were before that. So there's who we were and then there's who we became. Who we yeah. were was, like you said before, yeah. kings, queens coming from empires, nations. Then who we became was part of a colonialism, slave mentality, of a slave master mentality <laughs> and we took it all on and became second to third to fourth best <laughs> you know so yeah 
we have to look in the mirror, we have to look at our own people and look back at our history and our culture and you'll see how great we were, you know. And this is what, there's not enough, like we're always waiting for reparations. We're always yeah. waiting for help and hand. We're waiting yeah. for people, please wake up. But we have to look amongst ourselves and look how can we organise some positivity because it's always negativity that people are negative. I believe in energy. I'm an energy person, me, true spirit. Yeah. And if yeah. you constantly think of like negativity, you will take that negativity on and be a part of your life. So you need some positivity and, and you must connect to positivity. Go and look for it, you know. Don't just wait around or we'll wait for reparations and we'll be okay. Because what if reparations never comes? Are we going to help ourselves? You know? How, how do we change that narrative, though, James? How do we... You hit the nail on the head. The, the last event, I was... Say disappointed uh, is a word I don't like branding around uh, yeah. or brandishing around. But um, we, we didn't get the turnout that I thought we would have got for, for that. And it's how do we... How do we change that? How do we get the the generation? I, I look at it as the generation after me. So 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 I am not irrelevant, but I am now in the autumn of my life, in the autumn of my career. Have I got a? I've had a career. I've retired. I'm doing what I want to do now. So I want to give back more and and say to youngsters, you know, you don't have to walk through those valley of shadow of death. You don't have to walk through the darkness. That I did because because people talk about um, sellouts and I heard people when I joined the cops used to call me a bounty bar and coconut and everything. And you know what, James? I did. I, I honestly think I assimilated to fit in. And if I'm honest, it was um, I think it was a detective inspector, so I was off rank with good service before you get that confidence to go. You know what? I know who I am and I'm. As of now, I'm going to be me. But I still see, when I live in St. Helens, mate, and, and I laugh at this, I still go out and I see brothers and sisters who, when they see me, that they're embarrassed. You know, um, there's, there's somebody who parked near me to take the little one to school. And when they see me, they almost put their head down. And you can tell mm. dreadlocks, my image and everything, they are thinking, what the hell's the brother doing? Or not a brother, you know, I scare them because they think, yeah. what is he going to do? And you sit back and you <laughs> go, what is it going to take for us to see ourselves as we are? And when a brother like you are coming up and Naz and Patrick and Dredd and everybody else are going, let's do this. What is it going to take for us to gravitate to that instead of going into a dance hall with a little skimpy dress and flashing your boobs and everything else yeah you know? so I, i'd say we need more self-love there's too much self-hate yeah. of fitting in self-love and self-love come from um you know within <laughs> you know so and it, unfortunately it's like say you could be a very confident person you could have a lot of self-love but it's sometimes what you surround yourself by. They always say you're the product yeah. of your environment, don't they? So yeah. for me, I have really had to remove myself from around a lot of circles and crowds and negativity. For, yeah. you know, yeah. Because if I'm around it constantly, <laughs> then I'm going to be of that. Or people will just constantly debunk everything you say because they want to yeah. talk about something yeah. negative. So it's only through maturity I've been able to do that. You know, as a, when I'm younger, you know, year round, do year round. And and then eventually it's just like, you know what, I just became too conscious, way too conscious now, especially through traveling, studying. And I sacrificed a lot of things to become more knowledgeable, like where people were maybe going out constantly partying. Then I was, I was researching, I was reading. I was, you know, what, even YouTube, I love YouTube, but could you find in your own... Um, shows and documentaries and that. I can't watch the TV. The TV is program a total programming, you know, what to watch. I didn't yeah, mind, like, yeah. years ago, some interesting things, wildlife, African tribes, and, you know, like, them kind of things. But a lot of the time, 
uh, since that internet's come out and we're able to find our own information. Yeah. Now, yeah. Yeah. one thing I will say, and this is the impression again, a lot of the parents are to blame also for not bringing the youth in. And um, <clears throat> we could, sometimes we look at like, well, what's wrong with today's youth? I don't believe it's today's youth. It, it's the parents who are oh, not oh, encouraging oh. them. You know, we can't oh. just look at the, like some people say, oh, well, the kids are just spoiled these days and that. But you can't blame the, the, the children. <laughs> you know what I mean? You'd have to re recognise the family values with what you've installed. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Do you understand? Like, so people are always pointing at like the the youth these days, but you gotta you gotta have patience for youth, just like you know, you know, like our generation. But even though it might have been, the generations are changing. What I mean yeah, by changing, yeah. you know, they, they could, some people look at change for the worse, but then some ways it could be the better because they can get access to information that we couldn't get when we were a lot younger. So. There's the pros and the cons, but at the same time, we must work on our weaknesses and it's easier to rebuild our strengths, but we've got a lot of weaknesses in different areas. So, like I said, I had to isolate myself from a lot of different people because it was just general talk every day. It was just nothing is changing. You, you can't even create change. They don't know change. You only yeah. know that what... Um, what's the latest trend or what's, yeah, you know, the usual. So like I said, I've had to like come away from all that, educate myself, you know, keep traveling. It sounds I travel by myself. Sometimes I travel with close people, but like I say, I, I can't just travel with anyone, you know? No, no, no. That's the way part it is. It. So I think part of it, uh, no, I was going to say, no, uh, uh, I, I take my hat off. When when you were speaking that night about what you do with podcasts and how the opportunity came to you, yeah. and uh, you grasp it with both hands, um, I, I think I, I am, I'm a lot older than you, uh, yeah. and what I'm trying to do is when I meet another James DeBoer, how do I incentivize James? And I'll give you an example. Recently, and I'm talking in the last three weeks or so, there were two people who approached me because I've, I've, I'm what they call a structured assessor. So I used to interview people for jobs and things. And I've had a lot of training to do that, you know, assessment, whatever. And there were two people who approached me about applying for the same job. And I was quite honest with both of them that, listen, it's not just you who approached me, somebody else approached me, but I'll give you some coaching and whatever. I'm not up to speed with all the newest things. But come and see me and we'll do some bits. Um, there was a black lad and a white lad. Now, the white lad is was here, mithering me all the time. What are you doing tomorrow? Can I come and see you? Can I do this? And surprise, surprise, he's got one of the jobs. The black lad was almost like, oh, the, the rain's falling, this, the wrong type of snow, the... You yeah. know what the outcome is. Yeah. And I did ring him after that to say, have you learned what happened? But I see this sometimes. I'm not saying it's all the time. You know, and I've seen some, some really clever black people who will come to you and say, John, I'm looking at this and I'll go, um, I know somebody, I'm going to get you a mentor. You know, one of them wanted to be a, a lawyer, a spokes to a judge at the Crown Court, who's not black, he's white. And he was like, tell her to ring me, I'll look after her. And, and sometimes there are opportunities like you have grasped. And I think it's important to talk a little, little bit about how you ended up doing what you're doing, why you grasp the nettle, and how are we going to switch on the okay. future J out of this world? Um, well, how it started for me, like I said, um, I started researching quite early. I was always interested in different traveling tribes. And so then when I started traveling, I decided to start interviewing people when I was traveling. I didn't actually have a podcast show at the time. I just loved interviewing different people, like my little camera phone or I'd have a DVD camera. And that was basically it. So <clears throat> when I came, um, it was about um, 2020, the beginning, 
And I brought a man called Renoko Rashidi over from America. He's passed away now. He's actually my mentor. He inspired me to really get out there around the world. He was dealing with the global African presence all around the planet. He went to 125 countries. So his knowledge was vast. So now I brought him to Liverpool Caribbean Centre, put on a little show. And it was a great turnout. And then it seemed like after they did that, and what it was is I paid for them for the community with my own money. I didn't get nothing back. I didn't even, um, even the donations that were put in, I let the Caribbean Centre have them. I didn't take one penny out of it, of anything. It cost me money to bring them, but it was just so much of a passion for me to want to do this because I knew he is great. So you're not going to get everyone just saying, well, let me just pay for someone to come for the community. Yeah. I don't yeah. think you really even get that. Oh. Unless people do it and recoup the money back. But other yeah. than that, it was just a deep passionate thing and I felt that the city needed it. So after that, um, a lot of people, uh, well, the radio was calling for me. Like um, I went on um, Gunnan's radio, it's called Upfront Show. Yeah. Went on that. They had me on talking about world travels and all these different places I've been. I've been up with Shidi. So they had me on twice. TCR went on. Then next minute, I bumped into, <clears throat> came across a man called Chase Johnson Lynch. Um, now, he's from America. Now, I think with him being from America, this helped the podcast. Because an American people, yeah, he would he'd give me a chance before someone from Liverpool would give me a chance. Yeah, get that. And that's just the way it is. And that's what yeah. helped, you see, because I couldn't see someone from Liverpool give me that chance to, to have the podcast. I'll just be honest, <laughs> keeping it real. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, because people like to be competitive, you know, like they don't want to give someone, well, I'll put this person on, and, you know, all that one. Yeah, yeah. So, through Chase, anyway, he got me on his show a few times, speaking about indigenous peoples, because this is new to Liverpool, you see, like they haven't had someone who's been all different places visiting indigenous black people around the world. You've never, I, I've, I've not really heard of it too much. You know what I mean? I've not really heard of it lived all. So people gravitate towards it. He give me a, he got me on a show about four, four times. And then he just decided to say, I'm giving you your own show. Next minute I did five whole seasons. And then after the five seasons, I decided to just do my own thing now on the zoom, you know? So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really, it really popped off for me, and I think you know what, keeping it going and not giving up and believing what yeah. I'm doing is true. And being true, I don't need to be paid to do the, the podcast. Just like I didn't anything to do with African history or melanin people, I don't need to be paid to do it. I don't get funding to travel abroad. I use my own work and money and just do it. It's and at the end of the day, when you're so passionate about something and so pro African. You know, yeah, yeah. I, I, it, it just, yeah. it just, it just puts me above a lot of people in, in as far as that passionate African. And you know, anyway, when you're sitting there with people and the people there who claim they're conscious, black people, but when they're sitting amongst me, we're having deep conversations for like 15 minutes. I can see that the shriveling in the chair sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> that's just. How do, I'll be how real. Do we raise it? How do we raise it, though, James? So, so I, I would say, mate, compared to me, you were quite knowledgeable of, of your subject you know yeah you, and whenever your subject you, your knowledge and the breadth of experience that you've got i'm sort of like wow you know like you some people you you've got and I, i'll be honest people normally have about 30 seconds whether to switch me on or off and i'm sort of like right you're boring me now you're just waffling you know you are one of them that i go oh i need to know a little bit more now you you are stimulating my knowledge hope that i want to go yeah 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 tell me a little bit more but how do mm. we get you know i always think one of the things that us as 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 a group of people are not great at is networking and yeah. we're not good at marketing what we do so mm. um because again go back to history we don't know our worth so, so I do a number of things for AWF now, which I do it in my own time for free, but I want to do that. But I remember throughout my policing career doing a lot of things on top of my policing job, but I was doing it for free, if that makes sense. Yeah. And now when people ring me up and go, John, can you do a talk? I go, um, no, I'm sorry. 
you're either going to pay some money to AWF or I'm not doing it. Yeah, you know, yeah. and it's the same now. But how do we... I, I met and I know he won't mind me saying this. I had a similar conversation with Levi and he was saying, you know, Levi to far eye. And he was saying, oh, yeah, do it for, for this and I don't. And I go, whoa, 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 whoa. Man's got to eat. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Man's got to live. So how do we, A, signpost people to James? Because up until I met you, I never knew about your podcast or anything. And to give you a joke, my 23-year-old daughter said to me, what are you doing today? I'm on a podcast. Oh, you're trying to be young. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I had a giggle, but how do we sign <laughs> well, most people to you? And how do you, because I'd like to think in another 20 years, this has expanded for you. So, yeah. so I can't get said to you, James, here's 50 grand or whatever, but I can use my network to try and expand. I think there's two things, yeah. There's two things. What it is is, um, <clears throat> one, if if what you're trying to do is your only income, like I actually work mm -hmm. as a cook. Mm -hmm. So that's my job. That's how I yeah. eat. Yeah. Outside yeah. of that, I basically do all what I'm doing. You know, I mean, the podcasting, uh, whether we have meetings and return projects and connecting with people everywhere, doing me research, and that's outside. So you have to have an income, which I totally understand. Yeah, yeah. So, but there's a way to balance it where, okay, this is your time, you earn your money, you're doing this. But I think sometimes with some people, they're chasing the money too much, too yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, I get it. It, Now, don't get me wrong, if the museum wants you to come in, they should pay you. Yeah. Any any of these organizations out there with money, they should pay you. This is so yeah. I'm not told I'm um I went to the museum twice one time, yet I got paid. But there was many other times he asked me to come for free. So it did some time, but I said, you know what? You have got the money to pay people. There's a difference. So it's it's looking at the circumstances and we've got to try to juggle them both. If you're just chasing dollars and dollars and dollars, then you ain't. I can't connect properly to them. I'll just keep it real. No, you know what I'm saying? No, I can't. No. But well, if I, when I do my talk, so so I, I get opportunities to talk to like the WI and other organisation, and, and majority of them are going to be predominantly white. Ninety nine yeah. percent of them are going to be white. I go into school, probably ninety eight percent of them are white, but. If I finished off and say, right, listen, if you want to learn a little bit more about our heritage, or if I said to the odd few black kids or black adults, if you want to learn a bit more about your heritage, because it's not just ours, it's about theirs as well. What's, what, what's the signpost, you know, do I push them towards a link on YouTube or do I push them towards, does that make sense? Because I think that the, what you were doing is important and I think one more thing you... as well, John. What, what I forgot to mention, yeah. like you said before, some people you can only list for 30 seconds and then oh, I yeah. believe that someone like me could train teachers. What I mean by train is how to not just teach, of course, they, they've got the dollars to teach, but don't bore people and put people to sleep. Yeah, because there's a lot of people, yeah. speakers, doesn't matter the yeah. podcasters. The teaching in class, historians, they are absolutely boring. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. This is the problem. Like, and oh, yeah. That's just, I don't know what it is. I mean, me, I, I am a naturalist, you know, I, yeah. I don't, if, and I pick up about boring people. I'd have to, like, uh, you know, I'm no, good, I'm no good at this, or, or I'd have to try to figure out what can I do to connect. But remember, though, we all have different, unique personalities. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're not all characters. No, no, <laughs> we're not all, and that's no. just the way it is. So, get in where you fit in and do what you're good at. But at the same yeah. time, I can uh, educate people. I can also have a laugh with people. I can also make people think. I can also connect to emotions. I can connect to whatever's necessary, and that's just what I'm going to bring out, and. It just so happens that people happen to um, feel what I'm saying. Also, yeah, think yeah. about what I'm saying without falling asleep. Yeah. And yeah. not everyone, I, I, I wish, I, what you need to do is like, 
get someone like me and I'll give them a bit of charisma and that help them help them with yeah. the character, you know, give them a little kick up there, you know, just to wake, you know, yeah. the people fall asleep, yeah. And I think yeah. that's what it is, but um because the old way is, is dying. It's it's really dying. The new the new way is unfolding. But unfortunately, it's like that getting where you fit in, I'm not really with that. I'm not coming to teach and talk like you or you. I'm coming to bring me and what can you learn from what I'm going to bring. And that's why um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of times I've, I haven't been able to connect with different peoples because I'm not here to do it in your narrative. Yes. That's because yes. I see, I see yeah. that narrative yeah. as a failure to yeah. be able to bring us up. Oh, yeah. Okay, you, I understand the the importance of trying to get people into work, get people on courses, get people to do this. But at the same time, they have to have a self of love, a self of identity, a self of knowledge. Otherwise, they're just taking on a whole other narrative. Do you understand? So what I would say is that um, there's a lot of excuses out there and there's a lot of people just chasing the money. That's yeah. what it basically is. Yeah. So yeah. there has to be a balance to everything. You've got to eat. We understand that. But at the same time, yeah. you've got to teach, you've got to connect, and you've got to make the effort. There's many of us on this planet, and our people are everywhere. We have the internet now. There's no excuses. Connect to your people all over the world, just like I've been doing for the past over 20 years. You know what I mean? So, Do you know what, James? And, and, and I'm eternally grateful for you inviting me onto your podcast and, and i'll tell you um a, a personal thing I, I lost my mom about three years ago and truthfully it broke me it absolutely mm. devastated me because again she was in jamaica i couldn't get back out to be with her i couldn't get it took us four months to get out there to see her mm. and uh, i was broken you know it was the end of my police career covid lockdown i was absolutely nothing I was wow. broken. And um, the, the thing that I would say is it's brought me back to who I am was mm. reconnecting with my own people and my identity. And yeah. um, I, when I come to an event like the one we were went to or if I go to Caribbean Centre or I meet Ray for a cup of coffee or I sit down with G and we have some food or me and you having a chat like this, it's, I feel like it, it, my battery is recharged. And I think us as a people don't realise, doesn't matter how isolated we are, you know, I'm talking to you wherever you are. I'm in St. Helens. If I look out the window, I guarantee you I won't see another black face or a face yeah. looking like me. <laughs> yeah. However, when we link, we have got that connection. You That's know, and it. It, it, not sitting down and poor me, poor me. I don't do the pity party, you know what I mean? If you said to me, and I said this, on the night, if you said, John, we're having a function at whatever, and I want somebody to mop the floor, I'm there with a mop. Yeah. You know, but we need, we need to realise that together we are stronger. Another thing and, I'd say is um, sometimes um, it's like, say 10 people are applying for the job. Not always the great one gets the job. Yeah. yeah. And I think this is what people really yeah. have to stop giving a man's job to a boy. <laughs> you know what yes. I'm saying, and yeah. this is this is what it is. Yeah. It's um, it's it fitting in. It's the narrative, and yeah. like I say, I'd rather not get the job and be myself and have myself pride than have to act a particular way and not be me, be another person. As long as you can do the job, that's all that matters. You don't have to fit in. You've got the capability to do the job. That's all you need to do. But you know what? You you say that, and it's because you know who you are. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's the, they said if you don't know what you stand for, you'll fall for anything. Yeah. And I look at me up to the age of probably about forty, and I would fit in the the latter because I didn't know who I am, and I was falling for everything. Yeah. I wished I had your your knowledge and confidence when I was in my twenties and thirties. You know, and, and it, it, it's key that people like you, youngsters, see that positive role model because yeah. you know your identity, you know who you stand for. You, not only that, 
you are articulate. You know, it's it, it, it's it's not like if I walk into Asda or Tesco or whatever in St. Helens, 50% of the time I'll get followed by the security guards. <laughs> you yeah. know, I, I yeah. laugh and say I'm never lonely when I'm shopping. Somebody's always with me because I yeah. think they're walking around the company me. And mm. what they would expect is the narrative which they create in their own psyche as the angry black man. I don't fall for that. And that is what you are oozing, that charisma. I will say, excuse me, can you speak to the manager? just want to educate them about something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really do you know who I am. I said, um, can I just say on this time, this date, this is who, this is where it happened. Yeah. Why is it you're assuming that I'm going to be stealing something? Oh, of course, of course. Well, this, this is it, though, you know. Um, uh, it's... We are long. We are many, many years away from fixing these things, you know. So, yeah, I think like we can't let other people bring us down. If you're going into the no. shop, just go in there, buy what you want. If they're following you and following you, yeah, you did the right thing. Speak to the manager if you feel that. Yeah, I mean because yeah. let them know. Of course, yeah. Speak out. It's very important to speak out. It very it is, and um, people can speak out. Some people like be too aggressive. And then, yeah, yeah. But then you do the right thing. You're speaking to the manager, which can give them, let them know. <laughs> I'd say let yeah. them know, definitely. But John, it's been yeah. a great uh, discussion today anyway. This is James Thank the you, Bond, discovered and dedicated to original peoples as always. And John, we'll have to do this again sometime because I've enjoyed this yes. discussion. Yes, likewise, pal. I got as much from it as I hope you've got. Thank you very much. And, and shout out to all your listeners. Thanks again, pal. Enjoy John, the rest of your week. Thank you very much. Peace, my brother. Yeah. Oh, bless. See you later. God bless. Oh, peace. Bless.